The following video features four of the most shocking real-life animal attack cases that we've covered on the channel thus far. These include the chilling story of a woman who was eaten whole by an unknown species of shark while swimming at Australia's Tathra Beach, Yellowstone's most infamous grizzly bear attack that saw three campers attacked in one night, the shocking story of a chef who was bitten not once, but twice by the world's deadliest spider, as well as one of the world's most notorious, and not to mention tragic, crocodile attack cases that saw a woman snatched from the arms of her best friend by a massive saltwater crocodile. Like and subscribe if you're new. You're watching When Animals Attack. On what was a slightly overcast morning in the serene waters off the coast of Tathra, South Australia, what began as a routine swim for 63-year-old Christine Armstrong and her husband Rob took a tragic turn on one fateful day when she was fatally attacked by an estimated 11 to 14 foot shark. Christine was a dedicated member of the local surf club and a seasoned swimmer. She'd made Tather Beach her go-to swimming location for over 14 years. It was on the fateful morning of April 3rd, 2014 that Christine, accompanied by Rob, a consistent presence by her side during these times, as well as four other companions, all familiar with the waters they were about to navigate, set out on a highly anticipated swim. Their chosen route was a well-trodden one, stretching from Tather Beach to Tather Wharf and back, a round trip that totaled a distance of approximately 800 meters. Now, it's important to note before proceeding with the story that Australia has a long-standing history of shark-human interactions. In fact, the country is considered the deadliest location globally concerning shark attack fatalities, and since 1900, over 700 unprovoked shark attacks have been documented, leading to more than 170 fatalities, with many other victims left severely injured. In the year 2020 alone, for instance, Australia recorded 22 unprovoked shark attack encounters, which constituted more than 38% of the global total. Out of these, eight were fatal, with seven of them attributed to unprovoked shark attacks, accounting for over 50% of the worldwide total fatalities for that year. And additionally, 11 other victims sustained injuries from these unprovoked attacks. Now, given Australia's vast coastline, which spans a whopping 25,760 kilometers, it comes as no surprise that the country also houses the world's highest diversity of shark species. Approximately 170 of the world's 400 known shark species inhabit Australian waters. And this of course includes all the 12 shark species which are notorious for unprovoked attacks on humans. Over the past two decades, just three of these species, great whites, tigers, and bull sharks, have been responsible for fatal attacks on humans in Australia. As the group neared the halfway point of their swim, Christine suddenly began feeling sick, at which point she let her husband know that she was going to turn around and head back to shore. Little did Rob know that this would be the last exchange of words that he'd have with his wife of 44 years. As the group completed their swim to Tathra Wharf and back to Surf Club Beach, they would quickly find that Christine was nowhere to be seen. Led by Rob, the group then searched the beach for any sign of Christine, who'd been wearing a very noticeable pink and orange swim cap during the swim. It wouldn't take long before the group realized that she likely never made it back to shore. It was at this point that Rob would spot an approximately four meter long shark that he believed to be a bronze whaler or a great white, swimming not far from shore. Its menacing presence in the water was a haunting clue alluding to what may have happened. But from the vantage points of the beach, a bystander would eventually approach the group and tell them that he'd also seen a shape of a shark around the same size and in the same area as Rob did, his account adding yet another layer of grim certainty to Rob's worst fears. At approximately 8.40 a.m., police, paramedics, and surf lifesavers would be informed of a potential fatal shark attack which is when a large water police vessel, five IRBs, and two jet skis driven by concerned members of Christine Surf Club, as well as a Westpac rescue copter, were deployed in an exhaustive search effort. And an orange buoy was also placed at the location where Christine was believed to be taken by the shark. An independent witness was up on the rocks and had seen a large shark in the area, and it appeared that the shark was mauling something, although he wasn't able to tell what it, the shark was mauling. An extensive land and sea search has been ongoing since then, involving helicopters, surf lifesavers, and uh, some local people as well, attempt to locate her. It wasn't long into the search that Christine's goggles and pink orange swim cap would be discovered, attached to which was what authorities described as organic matter that resembled fragments of human flesh, bringing the brief search to an end, and at least some semblance of closure, to a devastated Rob. 
As speculation began swirling around the identity of the shark responsible, the initial consensus, based on its observed size and the descriptions provided by the swimmers, pointed towards the species being a bronze whaler. Now these sharks, they're very much known to frequent the waters around Tathra, and they can grow impressively large. However, it's also important to note that bronze whalers, they typically reach lengths of 10 to 11 feet, and although that's still a massive size, as mentioned before, the shark witnessed that day seemed to surpass that, and according to Rob and the other eyewitness, the shark that they'd spotted was closer to about 14 feet. This discrepancy in size thus led to growing doubts among experts and locals as to whether this was the work of a bronze whaler, or in fact, a great white. Species which are well known for being responsible for the highest number of attacks on humans on a yearly basis, and are of course capable of reaching sizes much greater than just 14 feet. It's also worth noting that while the number of attacks may seem high, the risk of a shark attack remains relatively low compared to other potential dangers. At least this has been the opinion of shark experts now for decades. Reputable sources on the internet, such as the Global Shark Attack File, suggest and continue to maintain the notion that humans are not on the menu for sharks, and that most shark bites on humans are out of curiosity or territorial, and they also advise that humans instead should be the ones to take precautions before swimming in bodies of water where sharks may live. They also advise to all swimmers to develop at least a basic understanding of their behaviors, as well as tendencies to reduce the risk of an attack. But before concluding this story, I thought it was very important that I note that despite what these statistics may say, there aren't nearly as many people swimming in our oceans as there are people on land. And we all know this. So this, in my opinion at least, makes shark attack statistics unreliable. And given the aforementioned global rise in the number of beachgoers and people who indulge in recreational water activities, the number of attacks worldwide is bound to rise with this higher number of people in the water. Now the frequency of these shark attacks are not limited to a specific reason, but a peak period which has been observed to be most active between the months of November and April. With Australia boasting nearly 12,000 pristine beaches and its coasts being home to over 80% of its population, the number of human beach visits during 2020 and 2021 for example, was estimated to be a staggering 500 million nationwide. And this increase in people in the water of course, also played a key contributing factor in the rise of the number of shark attacks. As Rob Armstrong and other swimmers were treated for shock on the beach, the tight-knit town of Tathra, consisting of a population of just 1,500 people, pulled together to show support, and the Department of Primary Industries went on to appoint a shark biologist to assist investigators and attempt to identify and conclude just what species of shark it was that attacked Christine. She's been heavily involved in the club um, in training and assessing of members. She's done over 300 patrol hours here at Tathra uh, and was a regular participant in the uh, ocean swim. Hi, I'm in Cook City right now, and uh, we had someone that's got been attacked and bitten pretty badly by a bear. On July 21st, 2010, a woman was jogging on Highway 212, stretching between Yellowstone National Park's northeast entrance and Cook City. With the small community of Silvergate nestled just a few miles in between, she jogged through the lush alpine area, enjoying the scenery, when suddenly she stopped in her tracks when a female grizzly with three cubs walked out of the woods and onto the road. The bears immediately notice this woman and the protective sow stands up on her hind legs to get a better look at her and see if she's a potential threat. The cubs on the other hand, who are yearlings, meaning they're still capable of doing damage, would at this point panic and in a split second, start running down the side of the road towards this woman. Despite her body begging her to run, the woman would, fortunately for her, listen to her logic instead. Holding her ground, she raised her arms and tried to look as big as possible, while yelling, hey, hey, causing the grizzly sow, who'd also begun charging as well, to halt, and quickly but cautiously herd her cubs back into the woods. With her adrenaline now pumping, the woman quietly but in hurried fashion heads to the ranger station, where she recounts her experience to park rangers, writes a bear report, while at the same time breathing a long sigh of relief for managing to get away from the bears unscathed. Just a week later, the Wilhelm family settled into their campsite within the upper loop of the Soda Butte campground, a popular location situated in a forested valley 
just five miles north of Yellowstone. The campground boasted 27 separate sites, each of them strategically placed among clusters of conifer trees, offering campers a sense of privacy as well as personal space. And unlike the more common tightly packed setups, these sites are spread out across a medium-sized campground, allowing for a more secluded camping experience. Not to mention it's also only about three quarters of a mile from Cook City, which makes getting extra supplies or food or whatever's needed really convenient. Now this campground also butts up against Soda Butte Creek, which is this really beautiful mountain creek. It's somewhat big for a creek, and it also keeps the campground quite cool in the warmer summer months. The Wilhelms had traveled from Texas for their family vacation at Yellowstone. The parents, Paige and Don, were extremely happy to be resting from an eventful day with their two sons on the night of July 27th. Don, who was a wildlife biologist, was especially excited about this trip because he understood that Yellowstone was a complete ecosystem in the Rockies, which still had all the original wildlife that you could find there hundreds of years ago, which includes everything from small animals like yellow-bellied marmots to, of course, big animals like grizzly bears. Now, by all accounts, that evening in the campground was pretty uneventful and was just a normal and peaceful camping evening. But that peace was shattered at 2 a.m. when the Wilhelms suddenly were woken up by screams. Not far away in the upper loop of the campground, couple Ronald and Maria had been fast asleep in their tent with their dog, when suddenly they're woken up to their tent being moved several feet all at once, at which point Ronald would suddenly feel intense painful pressure as something large bit down on his leg. He would instinctually begin punching the mystery assailant, causing it to let go and disappear. Now at this point, it's clear that he's been bitten by something big, which was able to move the entire tent by grabbing him, and so it was no surprise that knowing this, even looking out of the tent through a hole that the animal had ripped in the screen, caused him to shake in his boots. Despite his fear, he would go ahead and do so anyway, and just moments later realize the coast is clear. Maria at this point turns on a light as the couple examined his leg, which was completely torn open with two large lacerations down to the bone. Back at the Wilhelm's campsite, they'd heard Ron and Maria screams and a lot of shuffling noises from the campground, just a handful of sights down in the upper loop of Soda Butte. And for 10 minutes, they laid in silence, doing their best to interpret what these screams could mean. Initially thinking these were just rowdy teenagers or maybe it was a domestic fight, they'd suddenly hear new screams erupt in another campsite. And this time the screams were even closer, in fact, just a couple of campsites away. This is when the Wilhelms realize that these were no rowdy teenagers, these were no hooligans, but this was something much worse. Just moments following these screams, the Wilhelms would then hear a woman yelling, It's a bear! I've been attacked by a bear! The 58-year-old Canadian woman had been fast asleep in her tent when a noise and some movement would wake her up, and just moments later she had felt teeth grinding into her arm, realizing she was being attacked by a bear. She said, I realized that split second I was being attacked by a bear, but I couldn't see it. It was behind me and I screamed. I couldn't help it. It was kind of like somebody else was screaming and it continued to bite into me some more and even harder. It got very aggressive and then started to shake me, which is when I kept screaming and I realized at this point that if I don't do something, I'm gonna die. So I decided at that point, the only thing I knew to do was to play dead, especially when it came to grizzly bears. So I just went totally limp, got very quiet, and didn't make a sound. That was when just a few seconds later, after realizing I was no longer a threat or thinking it neutralized me, the bear then dropped me and walked away. She also felt like the bear was quiet when it was attacking and she couldn't help but feel that she was being hunted. The Wilhelms at this point sat quietly in their tent, trying their best not to attract the bears. But unfortunately, just moments later, they would hear some soft huffing and shuffling noises coming from outside their tent, causing them to instantly react. The couple grabs their children, two boys, aged 12 and 9, manage to make it to their minivan and quickly drive up to the nearest campsite where they heard the woman screaming. Upon arriving, they saw her laying on her sleeping bag near her flattened tent, her arm crushed and bloodied. But because the bears could still be nearby, the couple is watching all this from inside their minivan, afraid that if they were to come out, their lives could be at risk. This is when they decide to drive through the upper campsite loop and blare their horn as much as they could in an effort to not only scare the bears away, but also warn other campers that may not be aware of the immediate danger. Unfortunately, however, they hadn't taken their van to the more secluded and much more quiet lower loop, which is exactly the direction that the bears were heading. The bears were approaching site 26, which is one of the more desirable campsites in the lower loop, both because it's close to the creek 
and because it's the first campsite after the big gap between the lower and upper campsite, and not to mention it's even more secluded than the other campsites. 48-year-old Kevin Kammer, who at the time had been asleep at the campsite, had come out to fulfill a lifelong dream of fly fishing in Yellowstone National Park. An avid outdoorsman, he was a big-time fly fisherman who loved kayaking and was a married, stay-at-home dad with four kids from Michigan. He had set up a small orange and yellow tent on the day of July 27th and was no doubt planning his next fishing outing. As he blissfully laid down to go to sleep on the evening of July 27th, he of course was unaware that this would be the last night of his life. In the middle of the night, the distance from the upper loop and the sound of the creek was more than enough to drown out the screams of the other campers, as well as the chaos happening just a hundred yards away, and also much more than enough, of course, to mask the footsteps of an approaching bear family, as well as their airy wolves, as they tested the air with their powerful noses. As the bears got closer to Site 26, they would once again pick up the scent of what might be potential prey, and then it was at this point, in a really swift and almost singular action, they collapsed the tent, grabbed the stunned cabin camera from Kevin's head and shoulders, and rip him out of his sleeping bag and his tent. Back in the upper loop, both Ronald and Deb had been rushed to help, and emergency personnel had already been looking through their injuries, and officials from the Park County Wyoming Sheriff's Department and the National Park Service were also clearing out the upper loop of all campers before commencing a search for the responsible bears. It was a little after 4 a.m. when they finally got to the lower loop and found Kevin's collapsed tent, just 10 feet away from which lay his remains. The upper half of his torso was almost completely consumed by the bears, and a large puddle of blood was about four feet away from his tent, which is likely where Kevin had been killed via exsanguination, which is another word for bleeding out, just in case you don't know. And often this is the case when it comes to death via bear attacks, because as mentioned on the channel before, the bear isn't dispatching the person, they're just feeding on them, and usually people die from bleeding out. Unlike cats, bears don't kill gracefully, they just hold their prey down and start chomping away and usually this is bit by bit, so one can only imagine the agony, and one can only hope that Kevin passed away from the shock and didn't have to feel that much pain during the attack. The campers in the vicinity of Kevin's site, once again this was a very isolated site, they later report that they hadn't heard anything. In fact, a direct quote from one of the campers stated, I didn't hear a wolf, a growl, a moan, a whimper, nothing, meaning that these bears had truly discovered a quiet location which was perfect for predation. An immediate investigation was launched, and both Prince and Scat analysis would prove that the attackers were a bear family, and there had been one huge series of prints, followed by several smaller sets. Authorities promptly set traps around the campsites, and used bighorn sheep meat that they had available as bait. And it didn't take long to see results, as by 6 o'clock the very next evening, which was July 28th, the rest of the campground was completely evacuated, and an adult grizzly bear had been successfully captured. The adult female grizzly was tranquilized, and biological samples were obtained for examination. She was found to have a portion of her canine missing, and as mentioned before, the broken fragment of tooth that had fallen in Deb's tent during the attack, providing conclusive evidence that this was the responsible bear. However, despite this finding, they would still go on to conduct further DNA analysis, as well as other related procedures. Upon capturing the female, they would not long after observe movement of the young offspring within some nearby willow trees. It was at this point that they would set some additional traps close to the original trap, and the female was then reintroduced into the trap, allowing her to recuperate from the administered tranquilizers. Now this method proves highly effective in capturing young bears, as they tend to remain close in proximity to their mothers, and consequently these cubs were successfully captured using this approach. The bear family's relations were then confirmed through DNA research, and the female would then be humanely euthanized without delay. As for the cubs, it was decided that they weren't to be killed, but they also weren't to be released into the wild either, since they'd also fed on Kevin's body, which could very well have led them to being repeat offenders, having now tasted human meat. They were temporarily transported to a zoo, where they were held for a short time before being permanently moved to Utah's Hogel Zoo, where they remain to this day. It's an ordinary day at a banana plantation in tropical South America and a large 5-inch long spider has just finished consuming its latest prey item, one it conveniently selected from a menu featuring a variety of insects, small rodents, arthropods, and small amphibians. Upon finishing its meal, it cautiously climbs up a banana tree, tucks itself between a bunch of bananas in hopes of once again emerging at night to hunt again. 
Now what the spider did not see coming was a farm worker that suddenly showed up, cut the very same bunch of bananas that it was hiding in from the tree, and rather than running onto the man's arm or panicking during this time, the spider instead tucked itself further into this bunch of bananas. A few moments later, the spider finds itself plunged into darkness, as the fruit that it sought refuge in was placed into a crate that would then be nailed shut and put into the back of a truck. It wasn't until an entire week went by that the spider would once again see the light of day, halfway across the world in the kitchen of a pub in the UK. The spider, having been through quite the trip and having gone without food for days, had at this point, and understandably so, been highly agitated and defensive. And as soon as it saw an opportunity for escape, it would stealthily leap out of the crate and hide under a nearby dishcloth. Bridgewater UK chef Matthew Stevens during this time is busy cleaning the kitchen of the Quantock pub and of course isn't aware that a large, exotic, highly venomous and not to mention notoriously aggressive Brazilian wandering spider was hiding in plain sight on the kitchen countertop. With its back legs planted, its two front legs up in the air and its large fangs glistening and exposed, the spider has at this point assumed its classic defensive stance, one that it's popular for, a sort of intimidation dance, if you will, a tactic spiders of this kind often use to ward off potential threats, such as the few brave predators that dare to target it. Not knowing what was going on under it, an unassuming Matthew casually reaches for the dishcloth, at which point he feels a surge of pain shoot into his fingers as soon as his hand made contact, and he would also at the same time feel something squirm underneath the cloth. Well aware that its cover was blown, the spider would then rush out from underneath the cloth, face Matthew, and begin performing the aforementioned intimidation dance, now in full view. Now it's important that I note before proceeding with this next part that spiders in the UK are generally considered not dangerous to humans. The most common spider species found in the UK, such as the house spider, garden spider, and cellar spider, are considered harmless. And although they may bite if provoked, their venom is not nearly potent enough to cause serious harm to humans. The Brazilian wandering spider, on the other hand, native to South America, is considered one of the top two most venomous spiders in the world. Also known as Phanutria, the Brazilian wandering spider is notorious for its potent venom, which is capable of causing a variety of symptoms in humans, including severe pain and inflammation. The bite is often extremely painful, and that's due to the venom's powerful neurotoxic effects, and these neurological symptoms can include tremors, blurred vision, and in more severe cases, paralysis. Another notorious effect of this venom is called priapism. Now this is a condition that's very unique and is characterized by long-lasting and often painful erections in men. And if it's not treated promptly, it can lead to impotence. Other effects of this venom also include nausea, hypothermia, vertigo, sweating, and of course, death, which can occur in as little as two to six hours of a bite if left untreated. Now given this context, it's understandable that Matthew, especially given the likelihood of encountering a highly venomous spider like the Brazilian wandering spider of all spiders, would despite having been bitten, not immediately assume that his life was in danger and that this spider was not one to be trifled with. So not knowing just how lethal the spider was, Matthew then goes on to grab this spider with his bare hands, causing it to bite him yet again. And it was at this point that for reasons not known to this day, he throws the spider into a freezer pours a nearby pot of boiling hot water on top of it, and shuts the door. Just moments later, the wandering spider's potent venom begins attacking Matthew's system, as intense pain radiated up his arm from the bite sites, causing his hand to swell up to the size of a balloon. Dizziness began setting in. Not long after this, a friend of Matthew's takes him to the local community hospital, where doctors tell him to go home, get some rest, and keep an eye on his symptoms. Now this lack of concern from the doctors can once again be attributed to the fact that the UK's most dangerous spider is the brown widow, which despite its name closely resembling the widely known and lethally venomous black widow, isn't considered dangerous to humans at all, and has in fact no recorded fatalities on humans, at least none caused by the toxicity of its much milder venom in comparison to its cousin. It wasn't long before Matthew got home that he'd suddenly collapse to the floor and begin feeling intense chest pain at which point his girlfriend Kara, who was luckily there with him at the time, promptly called an ambulance and he's rushed to an emergency room at the nearby Musgrove Hospital. It was here that his symptoms began worsening. In fact, his heart had been beating so fast that he said that his chest felt like it was about to explode. And coupled with chest tightness and high blood pressure, Matthew at this point felt like he wasn't going to survive this ordeal. As doctors grew more and more concerned, 
They began trying to piece together the puzzle and get to the bottom of what was causing Matthew's intense symptoms. And the only thing that made sense, of course, was a spider bite. It was at this point that Matthews mentions to the doctors that he'd taken a photo of the spider in the freezer after having thrown it inside. Although because it was 2005, the cell phone pictures were grainy, when the hospital went on to send these photos to experts at the nearby Bristol Zoo, they would just minutes later receive a highly concerning response. We're sending handlers over immediately to capture the spider at the pub. With time being of the essence, a team of professionals from the zoo promptly arrive at Quantock Pub and discover the still alive spider in the freezer which they just moments later positively identify as a Brazilian wandering spider. Back at the hospital, a saline drip is then administered to Matthew and doctors closely monitored his symptoms overnight. Fortunately, and despite having received two bites from one of the most venomous spiders in the world, Matthew was miraculously discharged from the hospital the very next day and managed to make a full recovery. The fact that Matthew was able to walk away from this ordeal the very next day shows just how very lucky he was to have not sustained any severe or permanent effects. This quick recovery of his can be attributed to a couple of factors, one being that the spider did not deliver a large enough dose of venom with its bites, which likely would have caused more severe effects, and number two being that Matthew's physiological response to the venom, which can vary by individual, could have also been a key contributor to his survival. The following video delves into one of North Australia's most chilling crocodile attacks in recent history. In May of 2016, Karen's woman Leanne Mitchell met up with her best friend Cindy Waldron at Northern Queensland's remote Thornton Beach. Having flown up for a weekend getaway to celebrate a hard-fought victory against cancer, a rejuvenated Leanne was by all accounts excited to start a new chapter in her life. And what better way to do this than a vacation with a friend that she'd met all the way back in high school? We were at school together. Yeah. School yeah. friends? High school, yep. She was 14 and I was 15. She was so loyal, so loving, so kind, so generous, so funny. Cindy was the sister that I chose for myself. I always wanted a sister and she was it. Cindy and Leanne's bond was so strong, in fact, that even as life's journey took them on different paths, with Leanne moving to Cairns, they would, despite their distance, frequently keep in touch, leaning on each other during life's ups and downs. In times of joy, as well as hardship, they were each other's anchor, an aspect of their friendship that would eventually become crucial, especially once Leanne's life had taken a fateful turn after receiving a devastating breast cancer diagnosis. Well, I'm not very good at this, but anyway, hello, hope you're good, love you, I'm okay, I'm much better, I'm alive. It was during this extremely challenging time that Cindy would demonstrate just how unconditional her love, support, and not to mention her loyalty for Leanne really was, being not just a pillar of strength, but a friend that was the first, and perhaps only one, to offer such unwavering support and companionship. Her life was always crazy busy, and I said, love, you just can't, you don't have time. And she said, mm -mm, doesn't work like that, does not work like that. I'm going to be there, whether or not, you know, whatever you say, I'm going to be there. So she came the night before, and I remember I've got a photo that's the screensaver on my phone. So we were huddled there together, and it's so apparent on my face that I'm scared stiff. and. Cindy's got a look on her face, which is, she just looks like she's got it. She's got it. I've got you, babe. I've got you. It was with Cindy's support that Leanne completed the grueling treatment and would eventually receive good news that her cancer was in remission. It was at this point that the girls were not just relieved, but ecstatic, and would thus plan what turned out to be a fateful weekend getaway, just the two of them. We were just so full of this joy of being together in that place, alone. Because we've been friends since we were little girls, when it was just her and I, it was like being little girls again. On that fateful day in May of 2016, an excited Leanne and Cindy packed up their car and made the trip north to Daintree Rainforest, where they'd planned to stay at a friend's place on the beach. This far north region of Queensland is remote, and though it's undoubtedly beautiful, it's also located right in the heart of Croc Country. Upon arrival at the hotel, it wasn't long before an eager Cindy and Leanne would check into their hotel rooms and head out to the beach to start their celebration. We just wanted to run around, and that was exactly what we did. And in the process of doing that, we ended on the water's edge. We ended up on the water's edge, here to here. It was really dark. Cindy's back was to the water, and mine was to the beach. And... We were laughing, and then Cindy cried out to me, 
and uh, she said it's got me. And I, I thought that it was just that fright that you get when you're in the water and something like seaweed brushes you. And so I put my arms out and she took my arms and I said, I've got you, Pat. I've got you. It's OK, I've got you. And she was holding me and I was holding her. We were pulled. We were, we were pulled. It was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. Both arms, we had our arms wrapped around each other. The force was incredible. And in that, I lost one arm. I lost this arm. I'm still holding her and it stopped. We stopped and we'd traveled a big distance. We were now, I couldn't feel the ground any longer. Couldn't feel anything under my feet. And I've put my hand out I realised there was something and I put my hand out and I felt the top of its head. Then I started trying to punch and trying to hit and trying to fight and I was screaming and just trying to fight and then all of a sudden we were taken again with the same amount of force. We, we were taken and I held on as much as I could. I was clawing onto her arm and I was trying to get the other arm up to try and grab her and I couldn't, I couldn't. And then she, she was gone. I dived down and I couldn't see anything. And I was feeling around, frantically trying to feel and diving down and trying to feel for anything. I was trying to feel. And I had to recognise what it was. And I knew I had to get help. I knew that Cindy's best chance would be for me to get help quickly and the only help I could give was by screaming Cindy's name. Screaming, screaming, screaming for her to come back. After the horrifying attack, Leanne was quickly taken to the hospital with serious injuries, including puncture wounds on her arm that she sustained while trying to save Cindy. As she coped with the immense shock and physical trauma of the incident, an extensive search operation meanwhile unfolded. Police and SES volunteers would set up strategically placed crocodile traps and meticulously comb the land and water around Daintree National Park in search of any signs of Cindy. During this time, Cindy's father Pat and sister Annalie Annette would be informed of the tragic news and immediately make their way from New Zealand to Cairns. They would then journey to Thornton Beach, assumed to be the last known chapter in Cindy's adventure-filled life. There, amidst the waves and winds, they would acknowledge the search team's dedication and Pat, with a hint of his daughter's intrepid spirit, shared fond memories of Cindy's passion for outdoor adventure, and also noted that she would have been well aware of the risks that came with each one of them. It wasn't until a month later that wildlife authorities would finally capture and euthanize a 4.3 meter saltwater crocodile near the site of the attack, and after performing a necropsy, they would inside this croc find the remains of Cindy, the grim discovery bringing at least some semblance of closure to Leanne as well as her family. Your feet on the ground, you've got the beautiful water around your legs. I didn't realise, you know, I didn't realise. Somebody just said to me the other day that they only need something like, you know, 30 centimetres of water or something. I didn't, I, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that, I didn't know that. Do they need to be reduced in areas where people are going about the business of their lives, where the weather is beautiful year round? Yeah. And if it's going to prevent attacks and deaths? Yeah and if it's going to be in areas where we wouldn't ordinarily presume them to be, yeah, it's common sense, isn't it? If this episode piqued your interest, then our previous episode about yet another gruesome shark attack that occurred in South Australian waters, this one happening just two weeks ago, is likely to do the same. You can find it on the end screen of this video.